That's a good uh, text for our text this morning, which is John chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. Where the Lord says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Great text of Scripture. May the Lord bless the reading of it, and now bless us as we consider it in a few moments. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Have you ever spent time studying the names of Christ? It's very instructive. You could develop a complete Christology or theology of Christ from them. He has many names and titles. Some we're familiar with, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Um, written on his thigh is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Paul called Jesus our great God and Savior. He has glorious names that reflect his majesty. The Rock, the Sunrise, the Morning Star. There are, are many other names we could add to the, the list which conjure thoughts of His power and glory along with names that instill within us confidence in Him. He's all-powerful and absolutely reliable. In fact, one of His names is the Almighty. But the most personal and maybe the best loved of the names or titles the Lord has is, is this one, that of shepherd. Find it throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah 40 prophesies that he will come with might. Then, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Three times in the New Testament, Jesus is called a shepherd. In Hebrews 13, verse 20, he's called the great shepherd of the sheep. Peter called him the chief shepherd. And here in John 10, verse 11, the Lord describes himself as the good shepherd. He's everything that David wrote about in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Shall not want. What a great promise that is. It calls to mind thoughts of his care for us, his flock. And what is clear is that his care for his sheep knows no limits. The false shepherds exploit the sheep for their own gratification. They are thieves. But Christ desires our well-being. He leads the sheep out to good pasture. He feeds them, protects them, cares for them so that they will have good health. He is the good shepherd, which is a description full of meaning. The adjective good in Greek is kalos. It also means beautiful. We are, we're familiar with that from words like calligraphy which means beautiful writing. And the Lord is truly the beautiful shepherd, though His beauty in His incarnation was not in His physical appearance. Isaiah described that appearance. Really, it's the only a description we have in the Bible of His physical appearance, and that was He was like a root out of dry ground. There's not much beauty in that. Now, his beauty was inside. It was his, his character, and it, it was a compelling character. Tax collectors and sinners were drawn to him by his kindness, as, as were lepers whom he touched with compassion. 
He spent time with them, dining with them, and people loved him for it. But the beauty here, the, the goodness of the shepherd in John 10 is really explained in the next statement that the Lord makes, where he says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And shepherds in Palestine were known to put their lives at risk for the sheep, to lay them on the line for the welfare of the flock. Uh, David, as a shepherd boy in Bethlehem, did that. He told of how when a lion and then a bear attacked the flock, he went after them and rescued a lamb out of the mouth of the beast. And when it rose up against him, he said he seized it by the beard and struck it and killed it. A good shepherd puts the welfare of the sheep ahead of his own. Now, that tells us something important about shepherds. They, they weren't sentimental figures we might imagine them to be sitting uh, around idly with lambs gathered in their arms. They were strong and brave. It was a manly job, a, a dirty, exhausting, and dangerous job being a shepherd. David was certainly that kind of person. And he is a picture of our Lord but a picture that stops short of our Lord because the Lord not only laid His life on the line for His sheep, He laid it down for them and gave it up for them. And that must have been a very rare occurrence among Palestinian shepherds. When it happened, it was accidental. But with our Lord, it was deliberate. It was planned. He, he is different from all other shepherds. And his death was different from that of all other shepherds. When a shepherd died in defense of his sheep, it was a futile defense of the flock. It left the sheep defenseless and completely expo exposed to the predators and danger and helpless. But the Lord's death was successful. It was the defense and the very means of deliverance. His death meant life for the sheep. His work as a shepherd was to die. And his death is the theme of this passage. Four times he speaks of it in verses 11 and 15, and then in verses 17 and 18. But in verse 11... We learn the nature of his death. Three things in particular. First of all, it was voluntary. That, that's made obvious in verse 17 and verse 18 where he states, I lay down my life. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. In fact, we'll see this later on in the, in the garden when they come to arrest him and they want his identification, they're looking for Jesus, and he says, I am he, and they fall down at the very power of the words, which is to signify what he says right here. No one takes his life from him. It's voluntary. He gives it up. I lay it down on my own initiative. So the death of Christ was, was not an accident. He didn't die before his time. He died right on time. In chapter 12, he speaks of his hour, meaning the, the time of his death. He was troubled. He knew it was coming. But he asked, shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. His whole life was planned for that hour, for that moment, for that event. It was the plan from all eternity ordained. Peter said that in the first sermon of the church on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 verse 23. He was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Who slew Christ? Well, ultimately it was the Father. Jesus' death was no mistake. It was the plan of the triune God from all eternity and it was voluntary. It was also vicarious. That's the second thing we learn. It was a substitutionary death. It was for the sheep, Jesus said. It was in their place. 
Now the preposition for has different meanings in different places, such as for the benefit of, but it also means in the place of. And that's this meaning here. We, we have a, an ironic example of that in chapter 11 when Caiaphas, the high priest, speaking of his plot to kill Christ, said, it is expedient for you, that is you men who are the leaders of this nation, it is expedient for you of the Sanhedrin that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. Die for the people means that he die instead of the people dying. What Caiaphas was saying is we need to get rid of this man. He is a problem for us. If we don't, the Romans will come and take our place away. And so he has to die so that we live. In other words, he's saying die in their place. He, he spoke, Caiaphas did, spoke better than he knew. John said he prophesied unwittingly, but he prophesied saying that Jesus was going to die for the nation this is John speaking, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might gather also together into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. It's a death for the Jews and the Gentiles alike. But in other words, he, he will, would die in their place as their substitute. And that's the meaning here, in the place of the sheep, because only in that way could the sheep be saved from danger and judgment. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, Paul wrote that the wages of sin is death. Sin is a hard master. Men pay their workers in dollars, shekels, whatever, euros. Sin pays its servants in death. It's a hard wage, but it's fair. It's just. It's what sin earns, which is, is really a debt. The sins we commit build up great debt with God. So we're all obligated to receive our wage, which means to suffer death's penalty because sin against God is infinite in its guilt. But Paul also wrote, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And in His grace, God provided a substitute to receive the wage in our, in our place to pay off our debt for us. That's what Christ did on the cross. He died our death. The penalty has been paid. The sheep will never pay it for themselves. It's been paid. Actually, it has been paid. And paid fully by our substitute. Now that's the meaning here. There's no suggestion that his death was merely an, an example, that it was for the purpose of illustrating God's love in order that we would be moved by it to love others. That's one of the old but very common today uh, interpretations of the atonement. It empties the atonement of all of its value it's just an example. It's very common today to hear that kind of explanation. The moral influence theory is what it's called in various forms. Now there is some truth to it because the, crucif the, cr the cross, as we understand what Christ suffered for us, should move us to, to love as He loved. And so it does have that effect, but that was not the essence of, of the crucifixion. The, uh, the uh, assumption our Lord makes is that the, the sheep are in mortal danger. They need to be rescued. And they are in, in, in mortal danger from something far worse than a lion or a bear that is about to pounce upon them. They are under the very wrath of God. That's John chapter 3, verse 36. The wrath of God abides on the man or woman who doesn't obey the Lord. That's how that great chapter, which we get John 3.16, from which we get that, that's how it ends with the, the threat, the real danger that we face of the wrath of God. 
Well, it's in their defense. It's for our rescue that he laid down his life by putting himself between us and divine judgment. So when the judgment we deserved fell on him, he saved us by his death. So it was a voluntary sacrifice. It was a vicarious or substitutionary sacrifice. And third, it was a specific sacrifice. He died for a specific group of people, a, speci a specific number. He died for the sheep. He did not lay down his life for everyone in general. He died for his people in particular. As we saw, it was for the children of God, according to John chapter 11, verse 52, which we just read. It's for the elect. Those whom God chose to save, He saved. The atonement of Christ, the, the death of Christ, is not feckless, but effective. It actually achieves its purpose, which is to pay for sin remove guilt, and purchase the sinner. Save the sheep. Now, that tells us a great deal about the love of God. It tells us, first of all, it's effective. He not only desires the best for us, He actually does it. His love is not sentimental. It acts. It accomplishes it cannot be frustrated. The Lord is a, an absolutely reliable Savior. Nobody loves like the Son loves, like the Father loves, like the triune God loves. Nobody helps like the triune God helps. And this second person of the Trinity calls himself the Good Shepherd, who helps like a shepherd. And to reinforce that, the Lord makes another contrast in, in verse 12 and verse 13. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. Now, the hired hand was a servant and not an owner. He had no real interest in the sheep. His commitment was to himself and, and his own well-being. He is a person who is in it for the money, and that's all. So when caring for the flock became dangerous, he abandoned it. He has no personal investment in the flock, so took no personal risk for it. Now, Jesus didn't identify the hireling. He was a common figure around the flock, and someone that everyone would have, who, to whom he's speaking, would have been aware of and known exactly what he was referring to. And so he may have been re referring to, um, may have not have been identifying uh, the hireling, and just the idea is to to um, use him as a, something of a foil to uh, illustrate his great love for the sheep. But the religious leaders fit the description. Remember, the, the events of chapter 9 and their, and their treatment of the blind man had just occurred. The Lord's teaching in chapter 10 is connected with that. When he... When... when uh, this man was challenged about who healed him. Uh, he did not back away from what he affirmed, and he affirmed that, that the Lord healed him, since he, in fact, did. And when he said that, that conflicted with the men of the synagogue, the leaders of the synagogue, with their personal and religious interests. And so, what did they do? They put him out of the synagogue. They didn't protect the sheep. There are men like that in the ministry today. Hirelings, mercenaries, people in it for pay or in it for whatever they can get out of it, but who risk 
risk nothing for the truth. In fact, they oppose the truth. So they don't teach the whole counsel of God, don't proclaim the gospel of grace, don't warn of sin and call people to repentance and faith. They don't because they don't believe it. In 1923, while still a professor at Princeton, J. Gresham Machen wrote the book Christianity and Liberalism to explain why liberal Christianity isn't Christian. It is as relevant today as it was a hundred years ago. He wrote how liberal preachers will use the language of the Bible and the language of orthodoxy in sermons, but use it in a way very different from its real meaning. They oppose, they hate the doctrine of the cross. He wrote, they speak with disgust of those who believe, and then he has this quote, that the blood of our Lord shed in a substitutionary death placates an alienated deity and makes possible welcome for the returning sinner. Now that quote was taken from Harry Emerson Fosdick, the leading liberal of the day. Some years later, Dietrich Bonhoeffer heard Fosdick preach at the Riverside Church that John D. Rockefeller Jr. built for him. Bonhoeffer went back to his room that morning and wrote in his diary of the sermon, quite unbearable. He called it idolatrous religion. Then he wrote, perhaps the Anglo-Saxons are, are really more religious than we are, but they are certainly not more Christian, at least if they still have sermons like that. Fosdick and those like him are hirelings. They don't seek the good of the sheep. They use them and destroy them. There's only one message for a believer in such a place as that. Get out of Sodom. Go where Christ is. He is the good shepherd. He says it again in verse 14. He cares for the sheep completely and sacrificially. And, and Jacob gives a good illustration of that. You'll remember after he flees from Laban and Laban catches him. He catches up with him and his wives and all of his herds just before he's about to make it across the river. Uh, he explains to him, he told Laban all that he uh, went through as his faithful shepherd for so many years. He said, by day the heat consumed me and the frost by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. Now that's that's a good shepherd. It's a sacrificial life that he led in service of his patron, Laban. Well, Christ cares for us in that way. He is the one of Psalm 121. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He's our protector. He is our provider. He supplies all our needs, physical needs and spiritual needs. That's what the Good Shepherd does. He feeds His sheep even in dry seasons. When the land is barren, He leads His sheep to pasture. I used to see that in Israel years ago. There were shepherds and their flocks of sheep or herds of goats on the Judean hills just east of Jerusalem down toward the desert. It, it amazed me because during the winter there would appear to be nothing out there to graze on, just rocks and dirt. And yet the sheep and goats would be out there grazing on something. The shepherd knows where to take them. All they had to do was go where the shepherd would lead them and they were fed. And so it is for us. When it's, it's spiritually dry or a, a spiritual winter 
And nations go through that. Churches go through that. We go through that personally. There are times of dryness in our life. But in those times, Christ cares for us and feeds us. For time and eternity, for body and soul, the Lord feeds us as we follow Him. He knows how to do it. He's the shepherd. As the psalm promises, we shall not want. And so we are to follow Him. We are to rely upon Him. We're to trust Him in those dry seasons, through those valleys, the valley of the shadow of death. That's the nature of our relationship with Christ. We follow and He provides. It's a close relationship, one of mutual knowledge between us. And that, that is what the Lord goes on to state. He, he knows His sheep, and He says they know Him. Because He knows us, He cares about us, He leads us as, as, uh, 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 and shepherds us wherever we are. And because we know Him, we trust Him, and we follow Him. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. He knows our number, just as He knows the number of every hair that's on our head. He knows the number of everyone who is His sheep. He knows who are His own. He, he knew who we were when, when he, he brought each of us, He bought each of us with His own blood when He paid the ransom price for us. He knew who we were at that moment on the cross. And He has not lost one of us and will not lose one of us. But He not only knows who we are, He knows what we are. He knows our names. He knows our nature. He knows our person and character our age and maturity. He knows us completely, and it is impossible that He could overlook or forget one of us. And he is intimately and infinitely involved with each of His sheep. He knows where we are at all times. He knows our trials. He knows our needs. He, he knows our weaknesses and fears. He knows when we are sick and when we're worried and when we're discouraged. He knows our situation better than we do. And that should be a great comfort to us because as sheep, we wander. We get into trouble. Sheep get lost. They get snatched up in the jaws of wolves. As the hymn writer put it, we are prone to wander. But the Lord is a pursuing shepherd. A pursuing shepherd. Savior. He seeks and finds and never fails. He knows us well. He knows us thoroughly. Nothing about us surprises Him. He knows our needs and the secrets of our hearts. He's known us from the beginning. He's known us from all eternity. Mr. Spurgeon said, He did not buy His sheep in the dark. He knew all about us from the beginning. He's known all about us always. There's never been a moment in His existence He didn't know us. Well, this is one of the great imponderables of the Godhead, that He could see us from all eternity, wrecked and ruined by the fall, yet love us notwithstanding all. Another, as another hymn put it. But He does. He loves us notwithstanding all. It's a, a great and glorious truth because it means if He loved us when we were ruined and rebellious, completely unlovely, with fists clenched against Him in rebellion, then He will not stop loving us now that we are His redeemed and reconciled His children, His sons and daughters. It's a reminder that we're absolutely secure in His care and in His love. It's a, a great and glorious truth, as I say. I call it 
and imponderable, past finding out, beyond understanding fully. But, but that's what Jesus said in, in verse 15. Uh, ra rather, in verse 14, and, uh, and, and that he knows us and he loves us in spite of who we were and, what, and, and, and because of that he's made us what he is. But having called that an imponderable, what Jesus said in verse 15 uh, is just as imponderable. He knows us, he's all-knowing, but we also know him. In fact, he said, we know him like the Father knows him and like he knows the Father. Now think about that. How can that possibly be true? How can we know the Son of God the way the Father knows him? Well, not, of course, to the degree that the Father knows him, which is infinitely and completely and perfectly, not in that sense, but we know him really personally. We know Him truly, and we have real affection for Him. We love Him. We love to hear Him, and love to, to, to hear about Him and hear Him. His sheep know His voice. They are drawn to that voice. They are drawn to Him. We hear His voice when the Scriptures are read or when they're preached. It's the Word of God. It's divine revelation. It and only it is that. That's what our ears respond to. That's spiritually what we're drawn to. It's not oratory, style, or eloquence. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that, that can be very helpful and beneficial, but it alone doesn't feed the soul. It's the Bible and, and biblical teaching that feeds the soul because Christ's sheep want to hear His voice and that's where they, we hear the voice of Christ. It's in the Word of God. And as we hear it, we learn of Him. It is as we see Him in Scripture, as we learn of Him, that we are encouraged and strengthened in the faith. That we, we are given wisdom in that way and courage in life and, and more. That we are actually transformed as we study the Word of God, as we, we, we read it and ponder it and we, we hear it taught. It's by learning of Him that we become like Him in our character and our practice. It's what the, the, the regenerate, the born again, naturally need and what they want. And we can recognize it when we hear it. We have new ears to hear, new eyes to see. And, and we naturally respond to the Word of God and the Word of Christ that comes through to us. Bonhoeffer went to Riverside Church, which is a, a great Gothic Cathedral in New York City, a very impressive building. No expense was spared. It looks like a church. What, is, what, what does a church building look like? Well, go look at that one, and you'll know. That is what a church looks like, we would think. But he went there, and he didn't hear the voice of Christ. Not there. That evening, he went down the street to a Presbyterian church, Broadway Presbyterian Church, where the minister was reviled by Fosdick as a fundamentalist. But that's where Bonhoeffer heard Christ. He went home that evening, back to his room, and in, in, in his diary he wrote, the sermon was astonishing. A completely biblical sermon. And that's because it was about Christ. Christ. Now, I can't vouch for all of Dietrich Bonhoeffer's theology, but from his words and his actions, he took Christ and the Christian faith seriously and was a man that reflected much of Christ. Very soon after his experience in America, he decided to leave. He'd come over because friends and people that knew him or appreciated him wanted to remove him from the danger 
that was, a, was building in Germany in the 30s, but he decided very soon after coming to go back to Germany to serve the church in that dark and godless day of the Third Reich. The born again know Christ. They know Him in varying degrees, but they know Him. They follow Him and they become increasingly like Him as they follow Him and sacrifice. That's what's emphasized in this passage. Christ's self-sacrifice. And we become like that. But in verse 11, He said, the good shepherd... He said of the good shepherd that he lays down his life for the sheep. He ends in verse 15. I lay down my life for the sheep. And so if, if we love Christ, then we will love the sheep. And we will serve the sheep sacrificially. And doing that is, is really serving the Savior. Do we do that? That's a question that we should ask ourselves. This is how we apply the Scriptures. As we read it, we understand what He's saying about who He is and what He's done. We must ask ourselves, am I following that? So do we do that? Do we humble ourselves? As Paul in Philippians chapter 2 said Jesus did and put the interests of others ahead of His own. The Lord did that to the point of death, Paul said. Even Death on a cross, meaning even on such a cruel, painful, and shameful instrument of execution as a cross. He did it because He loved us, and because that was the only way that we could be saved from sin and guilt and the terrible consequences of that death and eternal punishment. So He, he took the punishment in our place. He became the sin bearer and suffered divine judgment so that we would escape it. It is a unique sacrifice. Only He, the God-man, could do that. But we can imitate Him by sacrificing our time and our energy, our, our possessions if need be, for the, the well-being of others, and especially for the spiritual well-being of others. We're to call the lost of the world to faith and, and help our brothers and sisters in Christ to grow in grace and knowledge of the triune God. That, that's the mission of the church. And it calls for sacrifice. That's what the sheep do when they follow the Good Shepherd. How can we know that, uh, that we're one of Christ's sheep? How can we know that we're one for whom He died? Died for the elect. He died for His people. We see this written in Scripture. He died for the sheep. How can we know that we are one of them? Well, the answer is very simple. By hearing His voice and believing in Him. Trusting in Christ as God's Son and our Savior. We, we can trouble ourselves over the doctrine of election it's a great blessing to me. I revel in it. But if it troubles someone, if he died for the elect, maybe I'm not one of the elect, maybe it's not for me. Well, you can settle that issue because we know who the elect are because they're the ones that repent and believe. They're the ones that trust in Christ. So trust in Him and settle the issue. They hear His voice, by the way. That's what the Lord said. How do you know you're one of the sheep? You hear His voice. So if you know you're a sinner and guilty and you want to be rescued, then you are hearing something. Don't ignore it. Respond to it. Trust in Christ. Only He can make you clean and save your soul. So may God help you to do that and help the rest of us, all of us who have put our faith in Him, to live faithfully for Him. To serve Him and serve one another. Well, we can do that by God's grace and God's grace alone. Let's stand and sing number 42 in the Songs of Praise book and then remain standing 
for the benediction. Hymn number 42. Lord, we can all say amen to that. Only through Christ in me. The race will end. Will end for all of us and sooner for some rather than later. We don't know when the race will end for us, but through the faith that we have by your grace that has laid hold of the Savior, because you've enlightened the eyes of our heart to see and understand these things and enabled us to lay hold of him, we are secure in him and we will finish the race and we will know, be able to confess that it was all through him and through him alone. And so we give you the praise, Father, and thank you. And thank you that you're shepherding us, your people, even now at this moment and you will continue to do that. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.